uh, say hi to us uh, back in the lobby. And um, and regardless, you know, even if you've been here a hundred times, uh, uh, say hi anyways. We really like to say hi to people. So uh, that being said, uh, speaking of saying hi to people, we're going to say hi to Pastor Greg. I want to say hi, Pastor Greg. Tyler, um, we are in our series with Daniel, and um, it might end next week, or it might end the week after, I really don't know. Next week is the Daniel in the lion's den, and then after that, it's the prophecies of Daniel, so um, we'll have to figure it out from there. I'm still going back and forth, but certainly this week is Daniel chapter 5, and it's when the story about when a hand appears on the wall and starts writing. Um, that's in English, we get this, when the writings on the wall. Whenever you hear somebody say the writings on the wall, they're not talking about the McDonald's menu. When they say the writings on the wall, it's about the future is sealed. We know what's going to happen. You can't change it. It's obvious how things are going to work out. Usually it's not in a positive sense if the writing's on the wall. Um, but that's, that's kind of where uh, that, this whole message is coming from, is what God is in the midst of doing and what is now inevitable. And that's something that all of us have to come to terms with with God. Some things are inevitable. They are the way God has said they are going to be. And you really can't really get away from that in any way. It is the way it is. Um, we, we read last week, it was uh, the week, the ending of the story of King Nebuchadnezzar with Daniel. Uh, Daniel, at this point, it had been about 65 years since he had been taken out of Jerusalem as a captive, as a slave, and brought to Babylon, which is just right outside of Baghdad in Iraq. And uh, today, and a lot of archaeology is still there, it's very interesting. And Daniel, of course, he was taken out when he was uh, probably about 15 years old. So now he's about 80 years old. The king that uh, brought him up into the, the royal administration of the city of Babylon, the fortress of Babylon, um, Nebuchadnezzar, he has been dead at this point now for about 23 years. And as Daniel would prophesy, he says, you know, there's going to be uh, several kings after you, and none of them are going to do well, and pretty much it's all going to end in the end of your empire. And that's what he would, he would tell Nebuchadnezzar. And it's exactly what's happened. And in this chapter, we see that in a very quick succession, um, one king after the other, after Nebuchadnezzar fell, um, they just kind of uh, were ruined. Uh, so, so the first guy you have is a guy was Nebuchadnezzar's uh, one of older son. His name, this is kind of, this is his name. And this is kind of fun. Um, his name was Evil Merodach. How would you like to be called evil? When I was a kid, everybody loved to be called evil because that maybe it's Knievel, right? But I don't know if it's not in that sense. It wasn't, you know, something to be proud of, but it's evil Merodach. And then evil Merodach uh, was evil enough that everybody wanted to kill him. And so he only survived about four years when his brother-in-law, see, you always got to watch out those brother your sister, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it matters who they marry. And um, he killed uh, evil Merodach, and everybody's pretty happy with that until he didn't do very well. And then the priests in Babylon, <laughs> got to watch them priests, they rose up in rebellion against uh, the brother-in-law and they took a younger son, and uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and they made him the king. The problem with Nebuchadnezzar was he didn't want to be king. He wanted to live out in the desert. He didn't want to live in the big city of Babylon. And so he had a kid, and this kid is the guy who we're going to look at today. His name was Belshazzar. And he said, I'm going to be a co-ruler with my son. So you guys raise my son here in Babylon. Let him be the boss, and I'm taken off. <laughs> and that was the end of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. We don't really hear about him anymore. He just made that little switch. So now we come into the situation where all of the legacy of Nebuchadnezzar has been forgotten, washed away. Nobody really cares about uh, anything from his reign. Now it's all about Belshazzar, um, his, his grandson, and what's going on? Well, unbeknownst to them, <laughs> they, there was a foreign kingdom, and this kingdom is today would be modern um, uh, 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 
as Pakistan, is that what it's called? <laughs> it just escaped my mind. Whatever that movie was in that uh, James Bond movie, uh, that's where they were. And then the um, other air is Kazakhstan. That's where the Medes were. And then you have the Persians. Now, Persians have always been about Iran. If you ever met somebody from Iran, they might tell you that they're not Iranian. They might tell you, oh, I'm Persian. That's very common. They just changed their name from some po political situations in 1935. So it really wasn't that long ago. Persians of one of the, of the longest living empires on earth. And so this was uh, an incident with uh, the Persians. So the Persians and the Medes, they got together and said, hey, let's do away with Babylon. It's very weak. They've got this fantastic city. There's enormous amount of wealth. Let's go take over Babylon. So uh, they get everything ready. Meanwhile, <laughs> Belshazzar doesn't have a clue. Not a clue. He's sitting there making all of these plans for the future, and basically what he's doing is creating a, a, a life of leisure, a life of luxury, and nobody knows anything, and nobody cares about anything. And one night, he decides he's going to have a citywide banquet. Everybody's going to have this banquet, and he requests the goblets and the serving utensils that were used that his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, stole from the temple in Jerusalem. So they took these very sacred objects, and he brought them into uh, Belshazzar's party, and he just desecrated them and used them for all horrible kinds kinds of things, and just doing his own thing when all of a sudden a hand appears, and it says on a wall by a lamp, so it's not that people are imagining things, it's very clear, Some there was enough light to see what was going on, and a hand appears, and this hand begins to write on the wall, so the idea is that it probably would have dug in, whether it would be stone, whether it would be some type of you know covering of that, it wrote in to the wall, and it wrote these words that nobody knew what they meant. And the Bible says that Belshazzar, I'm sure everybody else, was scared to death. Their knees were knocking. They were pale. Well, you know, of course, right? <laughs> if a wall, if a hand appears and you're supposed to be a happy party, well, that brings an end to that. And it writes these mysterious words and disappears. Now the only thing left are the words on the wall that nobody has a clue what, the, what language this is. And so he calls all his wise men. Guys, get in here, look at this, well, tell me what this says. And so all the counselors and all the able people and everybody, they go in to read these words, can't figure out, so I'm sorry, <laughs> we've never seen this writing, we have no clue what these words are, what they mean. So a queen comes in, uh, probably one of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's wives, if she had lived, um, probably survived for that time, but, but certainly Belshazzar's uh, mother, um, she comes in and she goes, you know, um, nobody knows this kind of language. I've never seen it. Uh, none of our educators would be up on this. But I remember Nebuchadnezzar had a prophet of God. And this man knew so much. And he could interpret things that were unknown to anybody else. So what you should do is you should call Daniel and ask him to come and read the wall and tell you what it means. So that's exactly what they did. He calls out to Daniel and he promises to give a reward to Daniel. He's going to make him the third most powerful man in the kingdom. Of course, the first most powerful man was probably him or his father, who's in the desert somewhere, and then he or her father would be number second. So they're going to make Daniel the third most important man in the kingdom. They got a, they're going to give him a robe. They're going to give him all kinds of gold. This is just going to be great. Daniel shows up, and he says, okay, yeah, I can read that, and I can tell you what it means, but... <laughs> What it means is that this robe and all this gold and all your, your waste of your life, it's not going to be worth anything. <laughs> it's not gonna, nobody cares about that. Nobody wants any of that. It's not gonna, it has zero significance because of what's going to happen. And so Daniel goes on to explain to them what these words mean and what's going to happen. He tells them, now Nebuchadnezzar, the issue with Nebuchadnezzar was he lived his life against God. He did not worship God. He thought he was the greatest and the most important. He thought he, his word was what ruled everything. But God had to teach him a lesson. And that's what we learned about last week. He turns him into this guy that turns pretty much into a cow. And, um, and so he says, look, Nebuchadnezzar had to learn his lesson of humility. And God worked with Nebuchadnezzar to explain these things to him.
But I don't think God is going to give you that kind of time to learn these things. God's going to judge you very quickly. You're not going to have the time that Nebuchadnezzar had to repent. It's either now or never. And of course, um, Belshazzar chooses the never, and he just kind of dismisses it all. Now, the interesting thing is, while he is dismissing it all, the Persians and the Medes are in the midst of attacking him. So let's, um, let's read uh, the, the response that Daniel had and telling them what these things meant. And we'll pick up here in just a small section of chapter 5. Um, I'd encourage you to read Daniel chapter 5. It's a fascinating, and I'm just reading a little portion here, and I've kind of described what brings us up to this point. But let's go ahead and read it. I'll start here with verse 23, and then you guys jump in on 24, and then and I'll go back to 25, and it's just a few verses. And so this is where Daniel is explaining to Belshazzar what's, uh, what's, what these words mean. Daniel says, You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. This is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, parson. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. When it says that that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, it means within a few hours. And how would we know that? How would we know that? A lot of the Bible's history and historical facts are corroborated by outside authors who are not authors of the Bible. So you can read the history from the perspective of uh, of what God was doing in Babylon, but you can also go into ancient history and find writings about the exact same events that are being described in the Bible. And so one of these is an ancient Greek historian, his name was Herodotus, and Herodotus was the one who chronicled the battle between the Persians and the Medes and the old Babylonians. And so he, we know the names of the generals and we know everything. Something fascinating about this was because he was chronicling from the side of the victors, the Persians and the Medes, he gives us some pretty amazing details. Now, Babylon, as we've talked about, was a city, a giant city, surrounded by two concentric uh, circles of walls. These walls are 85 feet high, 27 feet thick, and they were guarded by triple chariots. Who had, there was room for three chariots to run side by side around these walls. And they're basically impenetrable. And one of the ways that this city was able to survive through so many sieges and keep its power for so many years was that they had taken the Euphrates River, the same exact river that runs through, through Iraq today, runs through uh, Babylon, uh, not by, what is it, Baghdad today. And what they did was they, uh, they diverted the river to run straight into these walls. But then they had put a tunnel underneath the walls so that there would be a river through the middle of the city and then out on the other side. But it was also very good because the Euphrates is a very big river. And if anybody tried to get in, they would get caught underneath that tunnel and drown. So it was very safe. But what the Persians and the Medes did to figure this thing out and how to get through the wall was they diverted the the Euphrates up about 50 miles, and they sent the water out into marsh. And what happened was very quickly, the water level just fell about down to the height of their thighs. And so the foreign army was able to wade in and go through the tunnel and immediately appear inside of Babylon. And then it was very easy, hardly any fight whatsoever, hardly any defense was there, and they just basically took over the city from there, killed a lot of people, certainly Belshazzar was one of them. And we know this from Herodotus, who writes this, and you can access the, these documents and read these amazing stories, but that's exactly how it happened. It was very fast, and it was all at once. 
And we can look back on these things and we can say, what was God doing? What do we learn? Why were these things written in the Bible? Anytime you see something written in the Bible, you can ask yourself a question, why is this written in there? What is the lesson? What is the purpose that this has come to us? Why did they bother putting this information in there for us to read today? And so you always have to figure out what is the problem. And so just like with Nebuchadnezzar, the problem was pride. It was not giving God his place in society. God giving God his place in the priority of worship. And God, he does not like the proud. <laughs> he takes down the proud and lifts up the humble. And that's just across the board. And this is another example of where God takes down the proud and he lifts up the humble. And that's a lesson for all of us. And in this, we can see some pretty interesting things, I think, that come along. There's two lessons right off the bat that you can get from this. And the first lesson is this. God gets first place in our lives. He is not second to anything. You do not have more hope in anything on this earth than you would have in God. God, for the Christian, is always number one. If I have any confidence, if I have any hope, it's in God. It's not going to be in my financial security. It's not going to be in the size of my army. It's not going to be in the, my abilities and my achievements. No, it's God. God gets first place, and that's it. The second lesson we get here, too, is that the things that God gives us, the things that God allows us to have, or enjoy as a society or as individuals, those things have expectations of the way that they are to be used. There is a purpose for relationships. There is a purpose for wealth. There is a purpose for power. And the Bible details for us how exactly that is to be lived out. How do we do these things? Now, I find these things just amazing because if you take the instructions of God, how we are to live in, in these areas, um, and we glorify God with them, things go extremely well for us. But society and culture and ages always tries to say, God doesn't know what he's talking about. That was a long time ago. We get to do what we want to do, what we think is best. And whenever you start going down that road, things don't get better. Things get a lot worse. I like what um, Paul said in Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 24, right at the beginning of Romans. And it's a phrase that was just kind of haunting me as I was reading this. God gave them over to, their sinful de over to the sinful desires of their hearts. God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. I think that might be one of the cruelest things God to do is to give people over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to just let life take its course, to let sin take its course in the destruction of people. And I think it's very important for us as Christians, as we stand in an age where there's a lot of changes going on, there's a completely, uh, a, you know, a complete churning over of the values and the priorities, for us to be aware of how God wants things to be while God guides us and speaks to us and uh, leads us and how the world is doing. And sometimes you can see the two contrasting right against each other. You can see people doing things and promoting things and governments and all those kinds of things that are just actually against God's word and God's way. When that happens, the Bible is very clear, <laughs> be cautious. Good things are not going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. And, and I think as we do this, as we look into this, it's a lesson for us in our own personal lives also. And in the same way that it can happen in a culture, in the same way it can happen in an age, it can also happen for us on a local level, on a very personal level. These are things I think they should be, but am I living my life according to what God would say, what God, what God would lead me to do? Am I aware of how God would want me to make these choices and these decisions? Or am I making excuses, saying, well, I don't know if, we, if God really understands the world I live in, or, or God really uh, is up on what the whole situation, the context is, and why I need to do these things. So when, when we start making excuses and we start making reasons, you know, you're, you're going down a bad path. And I think for all of us, that's a challenge. Even I have a, a, a constant struggle. How, how does God want me to treat somebody? How does God want me to proceed in this situation? As opposed to um, what seems to be the most expedient? What would be the biggest result? What, what would work best? 
And it's a constant challenge. It's just about every day I find myself butting up against ideas that are against God's will. And if, if I really just come down to it, I realize this is not how God wants me to proceed in this, even though I see the efficiency of it and the benefit of it. Um, I have to stop and I say, but in the long run, or even in the short run, no, let's take the loss, let's take the loss, whatever we might see, but let's at least do it God's way. Because in the end, God takes care of everybody. In the end, God does bless those who do things his way and according to his word. And so we can see that and, and enjoy that. One of the, uh, the things I think is funny as we've looked through uh, Daniel is that a, a recurring theme is how dumb the wise men are. And it's, it's just all the way through. And the wise men, every time that they have to make a decision that the answer isn't just obvious, they don't know what they're doing. They just sit there and go, oh, geez, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, it's not right that you put this in my lap. I don't know what to do in this situation. I'm just kind of lost. Jeez, I don't know what's going on. Now, this is, we're talking about 600 B.C., so 600 years before Christ, 2,500 years or a little more than, than our lives today, how we're living. Have, have people grown wiser in 2,500 years? No, not at all. Maybe they've grown dumber. Sometimes it, it seems like that at different ages and different political situations that we see or, or the way people com comport themselves and their behaviors. It's not that they, we're getting smarter. It's kind of we're getting dumber. Now, we accumulate information and, and we do more with less as far as materials and you know, raw materials and elements and things like that. Yeah, we've gotten really good at that. But as far as how we get along with each other and what our hearts are like and, and how we uh, know how to live and how we're able to help other people, oh no, <laughs> it hasn't gotten better at all. And so the modern wise person is very disappointing. And, and we have to be discerning of that. We'll hear people stand up and say things like, this is the best idea. And you're, while they're talking, you're sitting there going, I don't think that's the best idea at all. I think that's a really bad idea. And then everybody will stand around. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's how things should be done. And you're sitting there going, I don't think God would like any of this. <laughs> this doesn't sound at all like something God would bless or something that God wants to see. And so the Christian is called to stand sometimes very alone. And many times we'll see next week in the lion's den, even with, when life is at stake, the Christian is called to, to just be there and say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. Because why? Because I have learned that God is always right. Everything God does is right. Everything God ordains is right. And I'm going to stick with God regardless of what it is because I know that is the one that's going to end up on the right side of history. And that's what we do as Christians. We make that price and we pay that price and we, with the confidence of knowing that things are going to work out. Things are going to be okay. And that's the way God's going to lead this thing. And I think in this, as, as we... Uh, as we come together on these things, uh, we can come to a point in our lives where it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important for us to be, able to be able to step outside of our own well-being and our own place where God would have us be. And to step into where um, sometimes, even though the world and everybody around us is saying, hey, go left, go right. God is saying, hey, go straight. Go to my word and listen up. Hey, I want you to look up to see where I'm leading in this thing. Look up to see what I'm saying in this place. And um, I think that's a call for all of us to not look down, but to look up to where God is, to look up where God is calling us. And to say, God, um, I see what you're doing. I see where you're we're leading. Um, one of the problems that we often encounter in life is that we have a confidence that we are going to be okay. God's not going to judge us so severely because we have, we have accomplished a lot. We've done a lot. And so we kind of rest in that place where we're like too big to take down, we're too good, or um, God doesn't really care, or something along those lines. And that, that, that story is a dime a dozen in society, isn't it? Like I was thinking just over my lifetime and some of the more recent things in my lifetime, uh, people that have done really wrong, but then they'll stand up and they'll use their accomplishments as a defense. And so like I'm thinking a few years ago when Tiger Woods, you know, was, was just absolutely horrible to his wife. And um, the, the whole thing was, yeah, but I'm the greatest golfer on earth. And surely all these sponsors, they're not going to give up on me. They're going to continue to pay me, you know, all the money. 
Because why? Because I'm such a great golfer. And so all of us have a tendency to fall into that, right? I mean, O.J. Simpson was shocked that the world thinks he actually murdered, you know, um, Nicole and Brown. But why? Because he's such a great celebrity, such a football player. Who would ever would, would you know, go against that? Um, you guys remember Bernie Madoff, the, the financier who ripped everybody off? Well, nobody's going to go against me. I've made so many people so much money. I, I got to keep finding more people to put money in so nobody catches up to what I'm doing. But I, I'm, people love me. It's just too good. And, and people get into this mindset and this mode. I think the other one that's more recent is Harvey Weinstein. And, oh, my gosh, this guy, you know, makes celebrities. He makes movie stars and uh, absolutely horrendous human being. But at the same time, people are saying, yeah, but, yeah, but. But look how accomplished he is. Look how, how things he come. And so this idea is that we build this wall that we think is impenetrable. We build this wall, and maybe this wall is power, or maybe it's prestige, or position, or, or peer approval, or just amazing potential. And we have this wall, and we think, this is going to protect me. I'm going to be safe here. Meanwhile, even as we are saying that, the enemy has a way of getting through that wall very quickly and very easily. And we all come to this moment where the writing begins to, to appear on the wall of our life. And even though we might have thought we could protect ourselves, we can't protect ourselves. There's a moment in everybody's life where you realize that God has now said, enough. <laughs> I'm tired of this game. We're not going to play this game anymore. I'm going to be done with this. And so I'm just going to let sin take its course and pull you out of this game now. And that happens. And it's hard for us to understand. We always think, oh no, it, it's never going to come and tear me down. But it does come in and tear you down. It's very common for people who give in to sin and follow their life of sin to have their lives destroyed like that. Just completely disappear. It's shocking to them that they finally got caught. It's shocking to them that something they didn't think was even that big of a deal has the potential and the ability to take everything in your life away. That happens. That happens. Um, you, if you read a whole lot about doctors and medical issues and health, I'm always fascinated by how many problems, they say 80% of the issues that we present when we go to a doctor, they are not caused by a bacteria, they're not caused by an infection, they're not caused by a tumor per se that there's a lifestyle cause of these things. It's the only explanation of it. And it's very consistent. It's not just a guess because we don't know anything. You can trace it back to levels of stress. You can trace it back to levels of guilt. There's a factor in just life that eats away at our health and our well-being and our mental, emotional state. That when we hide sin and when we kind of encompass it and keep it, it's a way that it comes back and destroys us, comes back and eats away at us. And I think back over my lifetime, the times that the churches I grew up in as a kid, they would take stands that nobody agreed with. They thought, no, you can't do that. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Of course, when I was a kid, when I grew up in Brazil, everybody smoked. I mean, everybody. Once you got to like 12, 13 years old, you're smoking like two or three packs a day. And it was just part of the age. You go on to a bus, and you didn't see anybody on that bus, not because they weren't there, because of the smoke. And it was insane. And my dad, who was the preacher, he would say, smoking is a sin. You shouldn't smoke. And everybody's like, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. But you give it a couple years, you give it some time, and finally somebody comes around the corner and says, Oh, this isn't good. This is not good. This isn't good. And I hear that in the church now. Some of you are going to be mad at me for saying this. But churches have always stood against drugs. Don't be altering your emotions and your minds with foreign substances. Don't be playing that kind of a game. And that destroys everything. I was talking to somebody even yesterday. We were reminiscing about how when we were kids... We weren't afraid of anything. There's nobody standing there to kidnap us. There was standing there to, to molest us and to take us out. We would go all over the city. Today, 
Oh, you don't let the kid out of your sight. I mean, they're just like, there's more predators than there are kids almost. And no, you would never do that. Why? Drugs. Drugs is such a motivator for crime. And I, we agree, I don't know, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I'm sitting here thinking, drugs have absolutely destroyed our society. Us living here in, in the Bay Area, what's our biggest problem that all of us would say right now? Crime and homelessness. Can you find a homeless person or somebody who's doing crime who's not on drugs? Good luck with that. When we live in a society where the city is trying to fix things by saying, oh, that's not the problem here. Let me give you some more drugs. <laughs> your, your problem is you want drugs. I'll give you drugs so you don't want them anymore. You've got to be kidding. These are the wise men. <laughs> These are the wise men. Does it get any dumber? And also, we come into this world, and the church has constantly stood against these things from the very beginning. I think someday they're all going to come around and say, you know, legalizing pot was really dumb. Wow, that was really dumb. I don't know why we did that. I really believe that things are going to come, because it always comes back around. Same thing with, with alcohol. The church has stood against alcohol for, uh, abuse forever. Oh, my gosh, the cost of that. And, um, but there's something wise about people who are being led by the Holy Spirit as they see God's word and they interpret it for their own lives. There's just an innate wisdom that leads to health and well-being and, and wealth to people also. There's something about that. There's a, there's a good thing about that that comes around. And I think as we live our lives according to God's word and according to God's way, we begin to see things improving around us because God blesses the humble. God blesses those who seek to serve him. God sees those, and God works to make things right with people like that. And I'm very grateful for that and how things see. Now, wh where do we go in our own lives and in our own days right here? As, as Christians, we are looking forward not to the solution of a political figure. We are looking forward to the day when God says, I have numbered your days and this age has come to an end. There's a date on the calendar where Christ will return. And we know that every day that goes by, there's one less day we have to wait. And there's a day when the king will come. There's a day when uh, Christ will say, just like happened to Daniel, um, Daniel, they lost all these, these kings, and they ended up finally with the Persian king, uh, uh, Artaxerxes, that says, you know what, I don't know what you guys are doing in Babylon. If you want to go back to Jerusalem, you guys just go right on back. <laughs> And something is happening in a big picture, even through governments, even through, through fads, even through celebrities, even through uh, phases of cities and political situations. God is at work, and the day is coming where God is going to say, enough, and he will come. And our hope is not in our wise men. Our hope is always in that day that is coming. We endure for that day. We continue for the day of the Lord. When the Lord returns, then he will bring about justice. He is the one who will bring back a home with him in heaven where everything changes and the evil in this world is, is eradicated and it's taken out. Where now we are alive in connection with who God is. It says even the sun, there's not a need for the sun. Somehow the presence of God is going to be the, what gives life and growth to everything. That's a day that we are looking forward to wait where we're waiting for. So when governments come and governments go and good ideas and bad ideas and clowns and other politicians show up, we go, you know what, that's not where my hope is. My hope is in the living Lord. My hope is in the living God. And that's what I am trusting. That's what I'm looking forward to. And as that day nears, you and I can draw our hope, we can draw our confidence in the return of Christ. That God's going to say, hey, it's time to come home. It's time for us to establish a new world order. It's time for us to begin this world in a new way. That's what we're looking forward to here. Now, names change, situations vary, but what doesn't change? The consequences. That never changes. Names, yeah. <laughs> pick a day, pick an age, geographical location, changes all the time. Situations, change, change, change. But the consequences for what God's word said never changes. It's always exactly that. It's always exactly that. It's not easy living in the quote-unquote Babylonian age. And Babylonian is a godless age. We kind of continue to live in that. 
It's not easy being the ones who are always on the outside, always the ones who are, are against, you know, what the, the, the new trend and, you know, what is the biggest or better thing. It's not easy living there. But we endure, and we keep on doing it, and we don't give up in our commitment to who Jesus Christ is and what he has promised and what we're looking forward to do, what he is going to do. That's where we keep our hope, and that's how we make it in this world. Even though Babylon, in the world of uh, metaphor, the Babylon today is, is a terrible place, it's a difficult place, and it's not going to be getting any better, we keep our eyes on Jesus because he's going to replace the kingdom of Babylon with the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we're looking forward to. I encourage us in this age to stand tall, to stand strong. We are here to be a benefit. Uh, the people of Israel who were exiled into Babylon were brought there as slaves. Their mission was to make Babylon a better place. It was to increase the wealth of Babylon, to make it a more peaceful place, and they worked to that end. So it is with us today. We are here to make our neighborhoods better, more stronger, more peaceful, more God-fearing. That's our role. And what's our role as members of a, of a little local church? In many ways, it's the same way. Our role here is to work with each other, to help each other, to come alongside of each other, to encourage each other, and encourage each other to find true happiness, to find the right path in life, to find a direction, and to find the principles and the values and the priorities of living that are truly meaningful, that truly build our lives up, that bring joy to future generations. That's what our job is here. And let's be found faithful in doing that as we point people and bring people closer to Jesus along with ourselves. Let us.